All right, welcome to Bet the Edge. I'm Jay Croucher here with Brad Spielberger from PFF. Drew Dinsick is out today. He'll be back shortly. Brad, great to have you. So you got a spiffy new camera setup from uh, last time we did this. Uh, looking very good. Uh, today we're going to talk about three games on tap. Raiders, Colts, Bengals, Chiefs, Packers, Vikings. They'll close with our best bets. But Brad, let's start with Raiders, Colts. Colts are three and a half point favorites. The total's 43 and a half. This line surprised me a little bit, given that this Colts team just closed uh, plus three uh, in Atlanta. I think might have been trending towards three and a half as well. Now they play a Raiders team that, by EPA per play, has had the best defense in the NFL since week eight. Uh, does this line seem too big to you, or do you think it's justified? I think it's very surprising, too, because the Colts really haven't had respect all year long. I mean, going into that Falcons game, they had the best ATS record in the NFL because they seemingly were never laying a field goal against anybody at home. On the road, they'd be catching maybe a full three or at least two and a half, you know, a good teaser leg a lot of weeks. So it is kind of surprising because I actually don't like this matchup. You just touched on one element there. The Raiders defense in particular, their run defense has been stellar. Um, And and the Colts, their their pass rate isn't – I think it's not actually reflective of how often they want to run the ball, lead the NFL in RPO rate by about seven percent uh per pff charting like I, I don't love the matchup for indy and i've been betting indy uh pretty much all year yep no i think that's reasonable i think the one thing with this game for the colts and it's probably gone a little bit under rate under the radar because one not many people uh watch the colts and then two not many people necessarily pay attention to their offensive line situation but i think the fact that Braden smith has practiced in full the past two days and looks like he is set to play just that re- upgrade over Blake Freeland, their fourth round rookie who's come in and has just really struggled to the point where, I mean, in the, in the Atlanta game in particular, which I watched an ungodly amount of, it, he just submarined the whole operation because he just could not hold up in pass protection. Minshew was under siege. You can't have Minshew under siege. Minshew already has enough things that he needs to deal with. And if he's dealing with that pressure, then all of a sudden uh, that becomes a real problem. So the fact that Brandon Smith looks like he's going to be back Michael Pittman is practicing in full as well. So how much do you think that alters the landscape for the Colts, just having those two guys back who are two of their best players? Fifth one was one I was going to touch on because I know he's TJ Watt and he does this to a lot of players, but that game too, you know, Blake, Blake Freeland, the rookie fourth rounder at a BYU. I mean, TJ Watt was in the backfield in, in a second and a half. It was almost like there wasn't a right tackle there. And Minshew is a guy that is very, like, he has happy feet. He bails on clean pockets. And so even when there isn't pressure, I think if he knows there's a bad matchup, he's going to just bail out of, you know, a lot of these clean pockets he does get and, and have happy feet and just kind of get rid of the ball before he probably should. So I think Braden Smith returning is massive and obviously – as is Michael Pittman in this game. You know, the Raiders have had some good play out of guys like Amik Robertson going back outside. But the reason he's playing in the slot is because he's like five foot nine, 180 pounds. Um, not the best of matchups against a six foot four, 225 pound Michael Pittman and obviously Minshew's safety net. So I think both guys in unison probably push this, you know, from two and a half through three to three and a half. And I think that's probably reasonable. Yep. Last one on this game, Brad. Interested in your thoughts on Indianapolis's run defense in particular, which was has been absolutely brutal for stretches this season, but mainly in the six weeks that Grover Stewart missed. And with Grover Stewart back, then when he has played, their run defense has been okay. But it was deplorable against Atlanta, where like if you got past Grover Stewart, then it was just a free-for-all because seemingly no one in Indianapolis can tackle. Do you think that in this matchup with Zamir White, who looked great against Kansas City, uh, do you think that shifts the balance to the Raiders or do you think that that Atlanta game was a bit of an outlier for Indy? Yeah, it's tough, too, because safety Julian Blackman has kind of been there like box rover safety this year, and he's been pretty good uh, against the run. Certainly want to throw his body around and at least take up a gap, uh, and he's now on IR out for the season. So it's interesting. It's kind of like a, a movable force meets a you know a stoppable object. The Raiders have uh, the least explosive run game in the NFL. I think just based on like pure volume, they may have the least rushing yards in the league. But yeah, you've seen some good play from Zamir White. Uh, it might be Josh Jacobs. It probably won't be, but it certainly could be, it sounds like. And obviously, Amir Abdullah mixes in, too. I, I would say advantage Colts here. I think working back Grover Stewart into the fold is going to be more meaningful as more and more time goes on. Um, I think they'll get that unit back to at least league average going forward. Yep, that makes sense. Surprisingly high leverage playoff game this one. But people may have not been paying attention, but the Raiders can make the playoffs now all of a sudden if they win this game. Beat Jarrett Stidham in week 18 and get a little bit of help along the way. And then the Colts, they effectively control their own destiny if they win this game and then beat the Texans. Uh, I mean, at that point, they likely 
win the division if you assume that Jacksonville have more than a 50% chance to drop one of the next two games, uh, which seems very much the case given that Trevor Lawrence may miss this Sunday. So surprisingly high leverage game, this one. All right, before we get to Bengals Chiefs, don't forget there's one last college football Bowl season Q&A before the playoffs. Join Vaughn Dalzell, Brad Thomas, and Eric Froton Friday at 11 a.m. Eastern as they handicap the weekend slate as well as the five games on New Year's Day, including semifinal matchups between Michigan and Alabama as well as Texas and Washington. All right, Bengals, Chiefs. This is one of the stranger games. If you had told me that uh, before the season that the Chiefs at Arrowhead would be playing Jake Browning and only be seven-point favorites, uh, I would have thought that that line was six points off or so, but the Chiefs are dealing with obviously all their problems on offense. Uh, their practice report is not being good. Donovan Smith, Legereus Sneed, Isaiah Pacheco, and CEH all have not practiced this week so far. And they get a Bengals team that is getting healthier, uh, did not cover itself in glory against the Steelers. Do you think Chiefs minus seven, is that big enough or, uh, or would you have this line different? You know, it was above seven and open, and, and I jumped on Cincinnati plus the points despite you know the, the effort they showed against Pittsburgh. Now I think it's probably where it should be. But you mentioned the first one with Donovan Smith. I mean, Juan Morris actually liked him coming out of college, but horrible matchup against Trey Hendrickson. Like, as bad as it possibly gets, he is not good in his past sets. Has, his feet are close together, and Hendrickson's going to just bowl over him a bunch in this game. Um, and, and so, so I think there are a lot of matchups like that you can point to um, in Cincinnati's favor to at least keep the thing, this thing close. Look, they have been bad on defense, allowing, you know, the most explosive and plays overall in the NFL, bottom three against the pass, bottom five against the run. But Kansas City's offense right now, it, I mean, it doesn't really matter uh, who they're playing. They've been struggling. Yeah, no, I agree there. Uh, so Cincinnati, their defense right now ranks 30th in the NFL by EPA per play allowed. Their defense wasn't a weakness last season, certainly not to this extent. Do you think that this is purely – a personnel thing with not having Jesse Bates anymore? Or what do you think is wrong with since his defense? And do you think it can be salvaged? Yeah, I think part of it is personnel. Um, you know, obviously Bates a great deep third safety and has been awesome so far for the Atlanta Falcons, but I don't think it's that simple. You also, I mean, Shadobi Awuzie coming off the torn ACL. Now DJ Reader on the interior, I think is a huge loss, but I, I think they've just been picked on, you know, they, they retain both linebackers. They are the worst team covering tight ends in the entire NFL. Uh, you know, EPA per drop back dead last, success rate 31st, and then completions 31st, yards dead last. Like, they're just matchups that they just cannot handle. Um, so attacking them up the, up the seams, over the middle. Um, and then when they have had injuries at corner or safety throughout the course of the year, or they're trying to work in Dax Hill and Jordan Battle and all these various pieces, you just see communication breakdowns. You see, you know, just issues with, like Anna Rumor likes to disguise so much and do so many different things. And I think it makes sense when you have a bunch of veteran players like Avon Bell, Jesse Bates, it's kind of complicating and over kind of confusing these younger players. But yeah, I don't think it can be just personnel. A lot of the guys are still there. Yep. No, it doesn't make a great deal of sense to me either. And this team has just been, I mean, drawing completely dead where Nick Mullins was marching down the field against them and Ty Chandler doing whatever he wanted. And they were dependent on turnovers to stay in that game. And then against the Steelers, I mean, Mason Rudolph, Dice them up. And Mason Rudolph also missed like a wide open 50-yard touchdown bomb to Deontay Johnson, which could have added on to the score. So a bit of a mess, but the Chiefs with their injuries at the moment don't think you can have a great deal of confidence in them. They somehow haven't clinched the AFC West yet, which is just a complete mess. Uh, and I don't think they're going to lose the AFC West because they're going to win one of these next two games. But uh, that that is completely insane. All right, before we get to Sunday Night Football, Packers-Vikings, uh, a little preamble to that. This Sunday night postseason position is on the line. Another chapter of an NFC North rivalry will be written. Watch as Jordan Love and the Packers travel to Minnesota for a battle with Justin Jefferson and the Vikings. Coverage starts at 7 p.m. Eastern, only on NBC and Peacock. Now, this line was hovering around Vikings minus two, but with the news that it is going to be Jaron Hall, uh, the line is trending towards effectively pick now as we speak the total is 44 and a half so the market doesn't have a great deal of confidence in Kevin O'Connell's decision there to go with Jaron Hall uh having watched uh basically all of Nick Mullins snaps this season I can't say I entirely disagree with the decision to go to anyone but Nick Mullins given that uh he is just a turnover machine uh what are you expecting from Jaron Hall in this one and do you think he will be an upgrade on Mullins 
Yeah, it's an extremely small sample, but he did look good in the like quarter and a half of football that he did play uh, before the infamous Josh Dobbs game. I mean, a guy with a ton of experience at BYU has played a lot of football. In that game, though, I think he, you didn't see a lot of weaknesses that were on his college tape. He was getting the ball out quickly. Um, the, the, the issue I have, though, is he loved targeting TJ Hawkinson in that game. Obviously not going to be playing here. And, and lately, the Minnesota Vikings offense, weirdly enough, even with Justin Jefferson out, they've been kind of an explosive passing attack. Top five in the NFL um, in explosive passes on the year with the quarterback injuries, the receiver injuries, all of those things. And look, you certainly can take a whole lot of shots on Joe Barry's Packers defense, but I think in this one, you know, they're, they're going to dial up some things to generate pressure. Their secondary is maybe the worst in the NFL without Jair Alexander in the fold. But I just wonder if Jaron Hall, you know, maybe tries a lot of the ball too long to hit some of those downfield shots and Rashawn Gary, Devontae White, et cetera, get home. Yep. And to your point about the Packers secondary, I mean, they conjured up the first good performance of Bryce Young's career. Bryce Young looked excellent against him. He had a PFF grade in the low 80s in that game. And for the first time, looked like a, a real and a good NFL quarterback, which was uh, presumably somewhat the product of the opposing defense. The Packers are just drawing completely dead against the run as well. Uh, I'm still scarred uh, by the Packers money. I lost on Monday Night Football against Tommy DeVito, uh, where it seemed like they just didn't realize even by the seventh time that Tommy DeVito was just going to drop back and run up the middle. Uh, you figured that they would uh, figure that out at some point, but they did not. Uh, and now they are facing an uphill battle to get into the playoffs. But you would expect that Minnesota, particularly the way they were able to run the ball against the Bengals, that they would be able to do the same against the Packers and have some success with Ty Chandler there. Um, one of the most interesting units this year to me, Brad, has been the Vikings uh, defense this year, which was uh, terrible last season, a complete mess, and was the reason why uh, they were in all these one-score games that they uh, fluked out and then uh, were dispatched of in the playoffs by Daniel Jones. But, I mean, how much of this defense do you think is real? How much do you think is smoke and mirrors by Brian Flores, uh, who is, I think, one of the best defensive coordinators in the NFL? Uh, like, where would you rate this defense just going forward the next couple of weeks? I think it's remarkable what Flores has done because I think to a man on paper, it's one of the least talented defenses in the NFL. <laughs> and they just are doing things differently than everybody else. You know, number one in blitz rate, number one in drop eight rate. And Love's been good against the blitz this year. He's actually a top 10 graded quarterback for us against the blitz. Not a super stable stat there. Um, and there's some traditional stuff too. But also you know, against pressure against the blitz is kind of variant. But this first matchup, it gave him problems. Like they really could not move the ball effectively uh, against this defense. And maybe, you know, that flips and they learn from it. But, yeah, I mean, Flores is just dialing things up. They've been healthy, too, kind of quietly, underratedly. Outside of Jordan Hicks, really haven't had any meaningful injuries there. But, yeah, I mean, Flores deserves – he's not going to win it. But, like, should honestly be in a strong conversation for, you know, coordinator of the year, that, that, that type of thing. Yep, absolutely. No, we agree there. All right, before we get to our best bets, a uh, reminder, you can find another way to celebrate the holiday season by being a part of – Premier League festive fixtures. We're in the midst of 29 matches over 13 days on NBC, USA, and Peacock. So wrap up 2023 by checking out all the thrilling moments across the pond from creative set pieces to scorching shots and amazing saves. It's the gift that keeps on giving as my beloved Gunners are losing 2-0 to West Ham as we speak. Uh, before we get to our best bets, Brad, little bonus question for you. Just interested because this is the market I'm most interested in at the moment, the MVP market. Um, keen for your thoughts on, one, who you would vote for, and then, two, who do you think is going to win? I probably would be in the Lamar Jackson bucket right now. I know there are a lot of arguments you know, on Twitter these days about you know EPA and all the various kind of volume and efficiency metrics that don't necessarily point in his favor. I think when you watch their film, they just the, the gravity he has is just different, and, and it's hard to quantify, and I get that that's kind of not a clean answer, not really the business that you and I are in, but it's also admitting that like this is not a clean year. There hasn't been, like frankly, like Josh Allen, Matthew Stafford probably would be like in the conversation for me, but I just know they're not going to you know, probably get there. Um, from a betting standpoint, uh, I bet Lamar Jackson going into the game against the Niners. You probably should bet on Tua Tagovailoa going into the game against the, the Ravens because we might experience the exact same market flip if the game plays out the same way last week's game did. 
Yeah, it's interesting, The I guess, the equity split between Tua and Tyreek, where, I mean, Tyreek, I think, would clearly be their candidate had he not missed that effectively game and a half. Uh, now I think it becomes a little bit closer. I still think Tyreek might be the guy for them because Waddle is out and so much of Tua's passing volume is going to have to go through Tyreek. I think deep down everyone thinks that Tyreek is just better than Tua at football, even though he's not the quarterback. Um, so that's... Yeah, that's an interesting one and uh, figuring out how that could change uh, if Tua does go off against Baltimore or Tyreek does. Um, the way I'm kind of thinking about this market from a, not necessarily from a who will win, but from a, uh, in terms of merit, I just think that if, if with Josh Allen, uh, if the Bills hadn't had 12 men on the field against the Broncos and either Jake Elliott doesn't hit the 59 yarder against them in Philly or Gabe Davis runs the right route, two things that are completely outside of Josh Allen's control. And he has those two extra wins uh, and he'd be on pace to go potentially 13 and four and his numbers vastly outweigh uh, Jackson's. I think that he would probably just win at that point, but because those two moments went differently, he, uh, he has a much, uh, much more uphill battle. But uh, yeah, if Lamar loses, if Lamar wins, I think it's close to a wrap. If he loses, then uh, then we have a chaos market again, and uh, and Miami Buffalo might be for MVP. All right, let's close out with our best bets. Brad, what is your best bet this week? Yep. So for me, it's the Los Angeles Rams laying five and a half points against the New York Giants. Um, a bunch of things here uh, for the matchup specifically. Obviously, Matthew Stafford, I just mentioned, playing at an MVP level. Uh, you know, a healthy team now with with Kyron Williams, Puka Nakua, and Cooper Cup. I'm not citing all the – I see the stats going around about how good they are because those guys – not just that. It's also the Giants, the way they play right now, blitzing a ton. Matthew Stafford's been great against the blitz, been get, getting the ball out much quicker this year, way more shotgun for McVay, way more gap and man and power scheme, which also – you trade Leonard Williams away. Yes, you have Dexter Lawrence, but I think you're going to be able to run off tackle, um, you know, and run between the tackles too, just avoid whatever side Dexter Lawrence is on, um, get in favorable situations, and then you know just navigate the pressure from Wink Martin Dale and pick on these young corners in New York, which I think they'll do very effectively. And then, you know, I like Terod Taylor, probably not probably certainly an upgrade over Tommy Cutlets at quarterback, but I, I just don't think there's enough there. Uh, I think the Rams cover this one uh, pretty comfortably. Yep. No, I agree with you there. I'm surprised that this line is so light. Do you think there's any upside in the Rams to actually like win the NFC? Cause they're 30 to one at the moment. And obviously the conference goes through San Francisco who is still in the box seat to get the one seed. But outside of San Francisco, like I don't think that Philly, Dallas, Detroit, I mean, these teams might be better than the Rams, but I don't think it's a massive gap. And so do you think that there's any, any upside with the deficiencies they have on defense that they could actually make a run? Good question. Like I do like it most likely first round matchup looks like Detroit Rams. I like the Rams in that matchup for a bunch of different reasons, not just because it's Stafford going back to Detroit, but I think it lines up very, very well for the Rams. It's tough. Like you said, at the end of the day, though, like the talent disparity come a late round playoff game with those other teams you mentioned and the Rams is just going to be heavily in favor of the other teams. And the coaching advantage that McVay carries against a lot of coaches will obviously be narrower against those coaches. So like... I don't hate the value because I really do think they are a team that could get hot and, and make a good run. It's just like trench wise and in the secondary for them against a good opponent. It just seems like it kind of fall apart. Yep. No, I'm with you there. I think there are a chance to pull off an upset and maybe two, but the idea that this team could win three games on the road, uh, I think it's going to be pretty difficult as you would expect for a 30 to one shot uh, to close out. My best bet this week is uh, Miami which is uh, the line is ranging from plus three to a juiced plus three and a half. I just think there are some factors working against Baltimore here. One short week for Baltimore coming off the massive game against San Francisco. Two, the injury report has not been great so far. Zay Flowers has not practiced this week so far with a calf, and he is their best weapon in the passing game now that Mark Andrews is done. Brandon Stevens hasn't been practicing. Kyle Hamilton, uh, it was described that he was uh, – not moving well, uh, which doesn't bode great for uh, a game in a couple of days. So I think you add up all of that. You add up that Miami is getting healthier. They should add uh, Javon Holland back. Uh, Teron Armstead is practicing, so it looks like he will be fine. Robert Hunt, also a chance to return. They won't have Waddle, but with Tyreek, looks like A-Chan will be okay most of it. Uh, I think they have the weapons. And I think that the an underrated story 
of the season is just how much Miami's defense has improved since Jalen Ramsey got there. I believe they're the number two defense in EPA per play since Ramsey got back in week eight uh, behind the Las Vegas Raiders, uh, bizarrely. And a lot of that has been the schedule. They've played the Jets twice, but they've had the Chiefs and the Cowboys in there as well. So I just think that this is going to be an ugly game. I think that the total of 47 is too high. And I think that the Ravens, just with the short break, with these injuries, uh, I think that this lands inside of a field goal. But uh, what do you make of Miami-Baltimore? I like the last point you mentioned right there, too, is I think this is going to be a lower scoring game, which obviously would lean towards taking the points here. Yeah, I I mean, I think Vic Fangio also presents a good matchup for Lamar Jackson. He's going to drop those outside linebackers, contain, have a QB spy potentially with Jerome Baker or David Long or whoever. Like, I think he just presents a lot of issues for what Baltimore likes to do. And yeah, Nose Flowers, you're relying on Rashad Bateman and Odell Beckham Jr. uh, You know, against that secondary, it's not a favorable matchup. So yeah, I'm, I'm with you across the board there. And then last piece frankly is just you know we've had the rotation of ronnie stanley and patrick mccarry i think chubb van ginkle even the interior guys will be able to get home um you know lamar was so good against pressure against the niners but not again not super sustainable to do what he did in that game and their defense honestly i know they had four interceptions the niners moved the ball pretty effectively most of that game uh they just couldn't kind of you know find the end zone yeah i wonder how much about that game and how much about this season goes differently if uh and aikman did a really good job breaking this down on the broadcast but if on that first niners drive if debo is purdy's first read and he hits him in stride for a touchdown instead of throwing the pick to kyle hamilton because they were gashing them on that drive with kittle but uh but alas uh it was not to be uh purdy's mvp goes up in flames and uh and we are where we are now uh brad thank you so much for joining us everyone can follow brad uh at under at pff underscore brad can you tell people uh what you're working on at the moment yeah, of course. Thanks for having me. And uh, it's I know it's not for everyone yet, but free agency season here for a lot of fan bases. So top 100 free agents over at PFF. There's a comparison player for every single guy, uh, a lot of stats and data and all that, contract projections. So that'll be the the cave I'm in for the next uh, four months is, uh, is everything free agency. Yep, very good. Make sure everyone you check out that. There's no one better than Brad uh, in that sphere uh, with free agency and contracts and everything, which will uh, take over uh, as soon as we are done with the games. All right, everyone, don't forget to check out NBCSports.com for more information to help you with your wages. Thanks for those watching on the NBC Sports YouTube channel. If you're listening to us as a podcast, don't forget to rate and subscribe. And a reminder to find all your favorite NBC Sports shows on Amazon Music. Just head to Amazon.com slash NBC Sports from Jay Croucher and Brad Spielberger. Uh, Have a great weekend and good luck.